Listen up. There's no more excuses. We're empowering those who want the hustle by exposing the status quo. The days of ordinary are over. It's time to crush mediocrity and start discovering your greatest potential. Welcome to the Hustle Nation. 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 Welcome back to another episode of the Hustle Nation podcast. Today, we have greeting card expert Jess Walker in the house. Jess is an entrepreneur based in Long Beach, California. She started designing cards in 2018 after her husband Tommy's cancer diagnosis and grew 5 dot post throughout his four-year fight as a way to support her family while serving the cancer community. Her love of greeting cards and small business led to a heart-centered company whose goal is to make connections of all kinds more accessible. Five dot card posts have been featured on numerous news sites, including Refinery29, GMA, The Home Edit, Huff Post, BuzzFeed, and more. Jess, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to y'all. We're excited Likewise. to have you here. I find the greeting card industry just really interesting in general. And I've been following you for a while online. I think I, I told you I found you organically on Spotify before you rebranded your podcast a long, long time ago. And uh, we're just really excited to talk about your journey and your story. So welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know I haven't recorded that podcast in a while, but it was so much fun. And I get people asking all the time if I should start it up again. And now I'm like, maybe I should. We connected through it. <laughs> The answer is yes. You should always. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Why not? Well, I'd, I'd love to start by having you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are now. For sure. I would never expect it. I would be where I am now in more ways than one. But um, I started the greeting card space. I guess I kind of came across it after my husband's cancer diagnosis. Like you said, he was diagnosed um, in October of 2017. And he and I were both actors. We were musical theater actors. We were mm -hmm. traveling all the time. So um, when he started treatment, that's not really something that you can do both of because cancer treatment mm -hmm. is a full-time job, not only for the person going through it, but also for the caregiver who's organizing things, getting them to appointments. Um, and we kind of had to put those careers on pause just because it wasn't feasible. And we obviously wanted to focus on his treatment. Um, I got a random job at a stationary gift shop near my house just to be near him and try to make ends meet um, with medical bills. And I, in that space, fell in love with not only paper goods and greeting cards, but also the idea of small business because it was owned by this incredible um, woman founded small business, but she also employed so many entrepreneurs that were local. So I'd see them come in and like drop off their small batch hot sauce and drop off their greeting cards. And I just thought that whole process was so cool. Um, and and through that, I, I realized that there weren't um, a lot of cancer cards that really fit the mindset Tommy and I were in, which we were young. He was otherwise healthy other than having this really unexpected diagnosis. It's a cancer that like 70 and 80 year olds get. He had esophageal cancer. Um, mm -hmm. We had it without warning and and we were just young and ready to just get, throw everything we had at this thing. We were not giving up. We were not looking for sympathy. We were looking to just like get in the game and fight it. And that kind of cancer card that's more encouragement than sympathy, I wasn't seeing. And we also were, you know, finding dark humor, using dark humor to fight it because it's so heavy and so hard that if you can't laugh at it, it can drown you. So I was like, I wonder if it would be insane to have funny cancer cards for young adults. And I had no idea if there would be a market, but I was like, I'm just going to make them honestly, just to make us laugh. And then if other people resonate amazing, but I had no intention of this becoming a full-time thing. It was started as an Etsy shop and, um, mm -hmm. it just caught on pretty quick that this was something people were craving. This was a hole in the market, things that I didn't I didn't know what that even meant that, that I was like creating a product yeah. that had a gap in the market. Cause I, again, I, I don't have a business background. I don't have an art background. I really built this through the university of Google, the, your, your idea of hustle, <laughs> which I really like how you explained that to me, the acronym that you guys have, um, and just determination to try to give back to this community that 
deserves the world. And if like anything that I could do can make their fight feel a little lighter, I was going to do it no matter what it took. I love that there's a mission and a purpose behind what you did. That that to me is awesome. But really, when it comes to greeting cards, I've always loathed greeting cards. And I think <laughs> for all the reasons that you've mentioned is, you know, if you want to give your mother a card, I don't want to go the sappy route. I don't want the long poem that I didn't write because it's not authentic. And then you want to give something to maybe your spouse, like in my case, my wife. It's like sometimes funny is good, but most of them are borderline inappropriate or not the not really the the right type of humor mm -hmm. I'm looking for. And then you want to give something to your kids. And it's like, I can never find the right card. I'm the guy who spends 45 minutes in the card aisle, like <laughs> leaned over, squatting, looking at these cards. And I'm just like shaking my head. And I think, why can't there be better cards? And I think in the store, most of them suck. But when I look at your website, you just you have a great humor, great style. And it's, it's very different from what you see um, in comparison to the hallmarks of the world. Right. I, I just feel like especially with cancer cards, but I've also, that's still a huge focus of my mission and my heart, but I have expanded into support cards for all kinds, whether that's just like a tough time divorce or a breakup or like, I mean, just anything. And I think that the, the thing that makes my cards a little more palatable than some that are like in the grocery store is that they're just like, to, they're exactly what you want to say, just to the point. And they're kind of like an icebreaker. And then you can say what you actually want to say inside. Cause that was something I found out too, is that during our cancer journey, it's like people can get so, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too. Like you can be so nervous of saying the wrong thing that you don't say anything at all. And it kind of creates a, a wall between you and the person you want to support. Cause you're just so scared of saying the wrong thing. So my goal is to just like get the words out there and like lower that gap so that then actual connection and support can happen. And I think that it's just like, you can use these kind of cards as an icebreaker to that next level support. And, um, also, it just like takes the fear of saying the wrong thing out. Cause also as a recipient of a lot of cards for cancer support, you're not going to say the wrong thing. Like just sending something is going to be appreciated. And even if you do say something that maybe like rubs them the wrong way, it's, it's still appreciated. Like, I, I think like if I can let anyone know, just go for it. <laughs> like, don't have a fear of it. Just it's worth it regardless. But if you need help coming up with those words, I gotcha. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, awesome. I think the big thing that I pulled out of that, right. Was the, the focus on the connection with people. Right. And, you know, oftentimes in, in heavy times, people are afraid to use humor because <laughs> it's, it's almost like it's inappropriate. But the reality is that's just another emotion that we have that, you know, to your point, in many ways contradicts so many of the other natural feelings that someone has when they're going through, they're going through hell, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I guess, how do you continue to craft those messages, right? Like, how do you, how do you get yourself in that, in that right mindset to craft those those right messages because, you know, that to, to Chris's point, that balance of, of humor, it is so critical, but it's for so many people, it's so hard to, well, is this okay? Is, is, is this kind of humor? Okay. Can you just speak to kind of how, how you find the inspiration for, for that in all these different situations? For sure. And I think, um, truly it's due to the experiences that Tommy and I have had, um, with cancer cards, it was really intuitive because we would, we were literally going through that situation. Like what would we want to hear if someone was trying to like encourage us through a chemo treatment or what would we want to hear if we were done with chemo? Cause it, it's actually complicated. Cause it's like people who finish chemo, it doesn't mean they're done with cancer. And like a lot of people don't put that together. So it's like, that was really intuitive. Cause we'd be like, I would ask Tommy, I was like, does this land, does this feel right? Or does this feel like maybe it's too much. And, and just doing yeah. that over the years, having his feedback. And then also just the cancer community in general, like I was such a small business and I was just putting stuff on stories. I'd be like, vote, does this feel like this would land? Does this feel like exactly what you'd want to hear? Or is this maybe like crossing a line? And, and just hearing that back and forth was so helpful that I think now, um, I've not only, you know, gone through cancer, but I've now also gone through grief and loss of my person. And, what that's looked like. And, and I feel like just learning through experience, like 
I don't know if I'd received that in that moment, that might not have hit, but, but maybe if I tweaked it this way, I actually would have liked to hear, have heard that. And it kind of started with, um, when we were very, very first telling all of our friends and family that he was diagnosed, everyone was either, they were just like, didn't know what to say, which is totally valid. Cause who knew, who knows what to say? Um, or they would try to say, um, like be positive. Like, I don't know stuff that felt like it's like, well, we are, <laughs> we're, we're doing that. Yeah. Like it felt, you know, and, and our favorite response was one of our friends. He just looked at us and he's like, dang, that is so, that is so shitty. And it's like the way that he said it, you're like, it is, you get it. It's like, it's bringing us to the same level. It's like acknowledging our pain, not just telling us like fight harder, be more positive, which is somehow like some of these cards are coming off that way. They feel like a little accusatory and it's like trying yeah. to find that common ground um, that I think is really that sweet spot. Do you think that your effort to change greeting cards that maybe some of these big companies like American Greetings and Hallmark, that maybe they'll change some of what they do because it seems like they've been doing the same old things for decades and they're they're still bad cards. <laughs> I, I would hope so. I think I would really love to see just the category of empathy and encouragement over sympathy be more prevalent. That's almost never a category in a lot of the the big stores. Um, even I just um, had my first card put in paper source in Barnes and Noble. And when you walk in, there's not like a super obvious place for them to go. And so I had a friend um, in, I think she was in, she was in Tribeca in New York and mine was in the pet sympathy card section. Cause I think they just like, didn't know where to put it yet. And so like the idea of like this kind of market and like this, just like them recognizing that this is the kind of message people want to receive, I think is definitely going to start shaping their categories, the way that they purchase. And it's not just me. It's, it's definitely, I think this generation, I think also generation like Gen Z coming up there, they also are like, kind of like skip the bullshit kind of cards I've been noticing. Mm -hmm. um, and they just like want to hear like, just skip to like what we actually want to say kind of cards. And I think that that is going to shape the industry moving forward. So Jess, as you were, as you were going through this and then, you know, whether it, him battling cancer to the grief at the same time, functionally building a business, <laughs> right. And to your point, you didn't necessarily see it that way to start, but you know, I'm sure as it, as it took hold, it, it became almost an animal of itself. Right. So how, how do you, you know, a lot of times what we talk about with hustle is sometimes it's, it's just those little behaviors that successful people have followed to kind of manage it all. And certainly you had far more things on your plate than most people can manage going through all that. How, how did you, how did you work through that on a, just a daily basis of just getting, you know, not even just mentally getting through the day, but just how do you, how do you knock all the things out in a given day? Totally. Um, one, I think like just to start, I obviously loved greeting cards, but I pretty instantly fell in love with just, entrepreneurship and small business and the behind the scenes tracking KPIs, learning all I could, like all of that kind of stuff. I just got really excited about. So that's, it's helpful when you really enjoy what you're doing, particularly that part. Cause I know there's a lot of artists who don't love business and I'm, I feel like I'm more of a business owner who likes art. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I think to start for me, I didn't have any fear and if I know that's like easier said than done, but I think that like starting before you're ready and tweaking as you learn on the go has served me so well. I know that it's easy for people to try to wait till something's hundred percent perfect. And I just think you get to perfection so much fa perfection, you know, <laughs> but so much faster when you just start, put something out, get feedback and, and tweak as you go. Um, I've, that's almost never failed me. Um, I think as far as balancing, that really full plate that I had, it was boundaries between work and life. I was very specific about deciding what I wanted my business to look like. And it didn't look like, I really hate that trope when people say like, I quit my nine to five so I could work 24 seven for myself. I think that that's a lie. I don't think that has to be true at all. And I think it's in place like kind of to scare people for no reason. Cause you can decide what your business is going to look like. It's yours. So I just decided I don't work on weekends. I don't work after dinner or I don't work like once dinner starts, like we're done. And it was hard because I was, especially at the beginning, I had so many ideas and was so excited, but that balance was incredibly important for me. And at the time 
really easy to set in place because I had something so much more important to focus on, which was Tommy. Um, yeah. I also think that action steps that actually create, you know, action as opposed to just grinding your wheels, like that became really important straight from the beginning. It was like everything I'm doing had to actually be creating some sort of progress. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't, I just dropped it. So um, that's really been how I've been running my business since it's like my actions are all really lean in that if they're not really moving the needle, I'm not going to do them. Um, And that's also served me well. Uh, I think once you identify those needle movers, consistency is the most important part, um, which I know is for me, one of the hardest ones, but it's just, as the years have gone on, I've noticed that that is for me, the key, like finding your needle mover is setting your boundaries and then being consistent with it. I'm just trusting that, you know, what you're doing. Um, Mm -hmm. that's really, yeah, that's been kind of the key to keeping, to keeping that balance, particularly when I was supporting Tommy through cancer, definitely last year, um, when I was really deep in my, my grief, which obviously I still am, we're, we're a year and a half out from losing Tommy. So it's, it's looking different almost every day, but I think because of those things I put in place early, it supported what I needed later on. I love that you mentioned boundaries. I think that there are a lot of people, including myself, who've been in business for more than a couple of years who have had to learn the hard way that you have to create and have, have boundaries and more importantly, protect your time and not just things that you want to do in your spare time, but important things on your calendar. I'm really curious, when did you implement that? And you know how, how have some of those things changed since Tommy's passing? Boundary wise? Yeah. And, and business in general too. Yeah. So basically like at the beginning, I, I don't know where I got this, like, like I just was, I knew I wanted to see how far this could go. Kind of like, I think my, my drive was just like to see what was possible. Cause I had no reference of like what was or what I was capable of in this field. Um, and I immediately <laughs> at the beginning of, well, I guess it was at the beginning of 2019, I got into a mastermind with a bunch of other um, women entrepreneurs. And I was seeing ways that I resonated with, which involved a lot of boundaries and ways that I didn't. Um, And seeing how without having boundaries, it can just like spiral out of control. And I don't know, I, I think again, my situation, like I think if I didn't have such a strong motivator to keep those boundaries being my relationship with Tommy and wanting to spend as much time with him as possible and be the best caregiver I could be. I think it would have taken a lot longer to set those boundaries. I think I kind of got like a crash course in what was important. Um, but it's, it has changed over time and I've, I've changed them as I needed. Like last year I was working like nine hours a week because that's what I had capacity for. And so it just, I had to decide what's important right now. Is it, doubling my sales from the year before, or is it grieving well and with the length of time that I need and exactly the way I want. And it was, it was that. So last year was a maintenance year. Like I scaled everything down. I almost did no marketing. I, when orders came in, I would process them over those nine hours a week and ship them two to three times a week. So like, I mean, it's, it's changed for my needs. And I think when you're this small, like when, like last year I had, you know, it was just me, I didn't have a team or anything. Um, it's easy to do that. And I think it's also really important to remember, like our business is there to serve us, not the other way around. So like, why do we have this business? And, and it's like, obviously we get in those moments where we're like, we have to grow every year. We have to have this percent increase. And it's like amazing, but also we're in this for the long run, the marathon, not the sprint. And so, I didn't start getting excited about those big goals again and that kind of thing until about January of this year. And now I'm, I'm jumping back into a mastermind in July. I'm, I'm now working normal business hours, like Monday through Friday. I'm, I have that capacity to scale again. I've um, grown my team and, and stuff like that. So I think like, especially in the beginning, just knowing that like, if you want this thing to go the long run, like you have to let it work with you, not, you can't work for it. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of how Mm -hmm. it's shifted over the last couple of years. But I do feel like now that 
I'm getting, you know, these systems really solidified. I have this new capacity. My team's getting bigger. Um, that will look less drastic, like <laughs> moving forward. Um, and the growth will be just more consistent because it's just like the net, the nature of how it works. I think. It's interesting because I think when uh, people go through a lot of stress or trauma, they tend to work more. And when you tend to work more or overwork, you can get burned out and mm -hmm. you can take that, that tragedy and that trauma and it can compound and, and make things worse because you're not taking the time you need to heal. And even just on a regular day basis, people need time for self-care. And when you mm -hmm. don't take time for yourself, and that can lead to disaster, no doubt, whether it be in your business or your personal life. And it's it's amazing Hear, hearing you talk about this. Um, it, it's, I mean, you sound like an incredibly strong individual. And I, I hope that a lot of people listening can take the inspiration from that because not everybody could handle it, I think, the way you've handled it. And so um, that's, that's incredible. I appreciate that. Um, I... Yeah, I do think that decide I just I did make the decision too really early on that I think has shaped a lot is that I've just decided that and again it's like easier said than done, but I just like made that decision that I'm my business is not going to stress me out. Like it's here, like it's something I enjoy. If it becomes something I don't enjoy, I'm gonna do something else. Like I I feel like I have the tools and the drive to figure out what like I mean, I think we all do. Like we we have we can figure stuff out. Um so it's like what we, we should enjoy what we're doing. And, and as soon as something, now that I made that decision, it's like, as soon as something starts feeling stressful, starts feeling tight, I shift it. So I, like, I really do like very actively and very consistently try to make sure um, I'm growing it in a way that still feels good and feels manageable. Um, and I think that's been really helpful. Jess, one of the things we've, Chris and I have talked about a lot recently is, is there's this, almost this thread of, Hustle means burnout, right? And and a lot of people associate those two. And one of the things we really felt is that if you look at like the most successful people or athletes or whatever that are, you know, hustling, they don't burn out because they have such clarity of vision. And, you know, just even hearing you through the different phases, how you were able to so quickly and clearly articulate your vision as a, as a person and as a business. And, and we see that that, you know, so the reality is, is you talk about how you scale back the business, but that wasn't because you weren't hustling anymore. You were, you were refocusing your efforts to the things that you really needed to at, the, at that point in time in your life. Right. And, and that's what prevents the burnout. And you know, a lot of people talk about work-life balance and, and, you know, a lot of what we talk about is it, it's more like a harmonization, right? So, yeah. you know, it, it, they got to interweave more than just, you know, you, you, to your point, you got to have boundaries and things like that, but that's really because it, you're trying to get them to harmonize together because you can, you can hustle in more than one category at a time. Right. Uh, but if you don't have that, that clarity of vision, I mean, even you're talking about now how, you know, you enjoy it. Well, you enjoy it because it, it sounds to me like you feel like a lot of people, which is, it's almost a game to you, right? Like the, the, yes, the KP, I say that all the right? time. Yeah. It's like the yeah, sins I mean, in your life. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you're making an impact for sure. Right. So, so you've, you're, it's filling your, it's, you know, filling your bucket, you're, you're playing a game, right. And that's what allows you to kind of rinse and repeat and, and come back. But I think that's to me is, you know, we've talked about this so many times that clarity of vision and really being able to iterate that vision for yourself in as your whole life and how, that really allows you then to pinpoint, okay, now where am I going to focus my efforts here going forward? I love how you said that. Yeah, you're right. That like, I totally agree that the clarity of vision helps a lot. And I honestly, like even the word hustle, like I love how you guys explained it because when I first, when Chris first reached out, I was like, I don't know, this, this isn't like just the word hustle <laughs> being involved. I was like, is this a good fit? Because you know, like it's such a, <laughs> yes. it, you're right. The hustle in mainstream just right now means burnout. And I don't know why we got to that point because I, I, <laughs> totally, I totally agree. It's not how I, how I think of it at all. Um, and, and yeah, that, that, I think that that clarity of vision and just continually, continually deciding what is just 
keeping the wheels turning and what is actually moving us forward and splitting those, I think that's really helped. Because I think for me, when I think of hustle in a negative way too, it's people who are just doing the same thing over and over and over, like harder and harder and harder and not like zooming out. And because you guys, I think you said the S is smarter, not harder. Like, I think that that is missing in a lot of just like this idea of hustle that's not healthy. Um, It's just like go harder and, and more as opposed to like, I don't, I just don't. Yeah. That's, yeah. I'm so glad you said it like that. Yeah. I mean, where are you, where are you spending your time? I mean, there's a lot of people on the gerbil wheel and yeah. they, they're, they're running really hard, but, um, and again, it nothing, nothing of substance happens without still a ton of hard work, right? You'd like, right. that's still, oh, that's still an ingredient, but it's, if it's, uh, and, and we've said is you can work really hard, but if it's, even if it's not applied to a clear vision, it means nothing because you're not going to end up anywhere. You don't even know where you're going. If you, if you compare it to, you know, a GPS map, right? If you don't know where you are, you have no idea where you're going. Good luck figuring that out even with Google maps, right? <laughs> right. I, know. And I, I want to go somewhere. Exactly. And I think um, it, the book uh, Essentialism by Greg McCowan, I read that early on, like in 2019 or, and it maybe 2018, I think that made a, a, a really clear picture of what it can look like if you don't have a clear vision. I don't know if y'all have talked about this on the podcast, but that book's fantastic for that, mm-hmm. that idea. It's like, basically the image yeah. is like a circle with a, a hundred little tiny arrows shooting off in a bunch of directions that are about, you know, a quarter inch long. But if you put all of those arrows into one, it goes like, you know, three feet mm-hmm. and, and you can just easily see how hustle without focus can just burn you out and keep you in the same spot without a lot of, and I think, I think it's helpful too. like to move forward, you need to see your growth in, in real life. Like it's helpful to see yourself moving forward. It's helpful to see that, that as motivation. And if you're just doing a tiny bit in a bunch of directions, you don't see it. And I think that just is discouraging. And then also it leads to burnout too. You bet. Jessica or Jess, I want to talk about masterminds. You said that you were in one. Did you mm-hmm. have one at one point or a group coaching program? Okay. Yes. And now you're about to join one again. Is this as yeah. the leader or as a participant? Participant. So I have done both. So the first one that I was a participant in was like a general business, small business mastermind for women. And I think it was so helpful because I was so new and didn't know anything. Um, it wasn't very focused because everyone was in different fields and whatnot. And then after I finished that, I, I did get so much benefit from it, but I was like, what if there was a really focused one for people who want to start greeting card businesses? And I felt at that point, you know, I mean, I, I was still small, but I, I'd had my first hundred thousand dollar year. I felt like I was finally like had really good systems in place. Like I knew what I was doing for, for the people who wanted to start. Like I, I knew what to, to do to help them. Um, and I also like wanted to meet people in that community and like get to know more people in that world. And so I did start that mastermind. Um, and it was so much fun. And I, I did that for about a year. Um, and then unfortunately just due to the nature of Tommy's illness and, um, the amount of focus like and time that I needed to spend on one, just keeping my business going while supporting Tommy, who was going through a lot of major surgeries. I did have to close that mastermind at the time. Um, I might may or may not reopen it again, but I feel like I'm in this season right now where I, I had to choose, like, again, it's like that essentialism thing. Like, what do I actually want to focus on right now? And I might save that for the future, but right now I'm really interested in seeing how I can scale my wholesale business, the wholesale side of my business to see what's possible there. Cause I'm just having so much fun in that space. I just went to my first trade show in April and learned so much, had a blast. And I'm really getting to see like what this could look like, you know, getting in my first big box stores being Barnes and Noble and paper source. Like I only have one card in there right now, but it, that was such a huge goal. And I just know that there's so much more opportunity there. So there is a mastermind from this um, woman, Katie Hunt, who I did her wholesale course like a couple of years ago. And that's really what launched me into the wholesale space. Um, it's her mastermind for people who are now like kind of at this, like in the greeting card space, this next level of wanting to really expand and, you know, be in thousands of stores. And, and um, I'm 
in about 250 right now. So I feel like it's like such a sweet spot to really learn so much from her. So I'm doing her six month mastermind to focus on that. So I think like to, I love learning, but I think I love learning also in a really hyper-focused space. So it's like one thing at a time. Cause I, I, I have ADHD. I get really excited about a bunch of things at one time. And when I'm doing that, I, it does, it doesn't really make a lot of forward progress, but I think this kind of space, particularly with masterminds, if someone, you know, the listeners are looking for that, I would say get in something as close to your field or your goals as possible. Um, and I think that can really slipstream you in to where you want to be fast, like in a, in a pretty significant way. It sounds like this played a really big role in your success and your career so far. Um, I'd be curious. I, I think there's a lot of people who listen to the show who have heard about masterminds and may have an idea but probably like me, they're like, ah, oh, you know, I, I know enough. I don't need a mastermind. Could you talk a little bit about what it's like being in one and what you and maybe what some of your peers have taken away? Because uh, I, I feel like I've known a lot of successful people have been a part of one who have said nothing but good things. But maybe people are scared away by the price tag because some are expensive. But mm -hmm. then you get people like Russell Brunson who, and you see people in his program who have 2X, 3X, 4X their business because of it. So I'd love to hear what your experience was. I think that the person signing up for the mastermind needs to know that the results are in your hands. So I never sign up for something and decide that that's going to save my business. That's going to be the key. It has to be your effort, your, your hustle. You are going to decide before you start to get something out of it. Um, I've of course also signed up for things that I maybe weren't worth the value that I got. You know, I, I had a, in no way naming names, but like I worked with like a social media coach and I, I feel like I wasn't in this space to really receive cause I was just like spread too thin. And I don't think that was the right thing for me to sign up with at that time. Um, and sometimes you sign up for things that aren't as advertised and maybe aren't the value you expect, but like you just have to decide that everything that you choose to do, you choose to put your skin in the game, your money in, you're going to get something out of. And and that I think takes the fear out of it because that is, is your decision. And, and maybe it's just like one little tidbit. And at the time you're like, I don't know if that was really worth it, but you know, a couple years down the line, maybe that decision shaped the way you did a product line or like, um, and, and that's how I've, I've had, you know, some moments in masterminds that have just been like mind blowing shaped my business, even in that very first one, just like the groundwork was so helpful. And I use that still today. Um, specifically with these hyper-focused masterminds, just, just the ones that teach skill sets too, I think are very helpful. Like if they outline, like, I'm going to teach you how to how, talking about the course that I did with, um, with Katie, like I am going to teach you how to set up for a trade show. We're going to talk about how to set up the walls. We're going to talk about the light, like that kind of thing. Amazing. Like, you know, you're going to get the value out of that. And, and a lot of those do have like the community aspect where you can bounce ideas off of people. And I found that to be invaluable. So if you find one that um, also has that community aspect, maybe, you know, like a Facebook group or a, a chat room, so helpful. But I would say just like, don't sign up for something thinking that they're going to save your business because no one's going to save your business, but you. So it might help you get closer to what you're looking for. But if that's your mindset going in, I would be hesitant. Um, but otherwise I just think they're so valuable. And I think we should always be learning because it's truly evolve or die. Honestly, like you can't get your business to a point where I think, I think a lot of people think that, and I've, I've thought that too in the past where it's like, I'm going to get, do all these things and get my business to this point and the funnels and the ads and everything's just going to keep it running for life. And I never have to do anything again. And that's just simply not true. Like if you're not really refocusing every, you know, quarter, every six months, every year in a new way, you're not going to grow because I do feel like the way I'm running my business now, isn't the way my you know, hypothetically, like million dollar business is going to run. It's going to be completely different because that's just how scaling works. And I just think like learning regardless is always going to be helpful. I come from a marketing background and um, I know in, in my space, a lot of people get frustrated and mad when these algorithms and platforms change or when a, a platform they have reach decline or whatever might happen. It, it happens every single day. You get these newsletters about how this is changing on YouTube and that's changing on TikTok. And 
I, I love it, actually. I've grown to a like and love change. And the reason being is that if you can be an early adapter, so for example, mm-hmm. if you were posting on TikTok five years ago, virality was a real probability. Like you could have posted a video one night, woke up the next day and had a million views. Now, was it super highly likely? No, but today that is less than one in a million. It's not probable at all. And so I just think that if you can be the first one to the party, whether it be something in business or something in AI or marketing, it can pay major dividends. And so I think you're right though. Be an early adapter, try new things. I mean, what's the worst that can happen, right? And as you said before early on is maybe something where you made a mistake could turn into one of your greatest lessons. Mm -hmm. And so- I've learned to embrace failure as much as I've learned to embrace change. And I think that everything you said about that is, is a great mindset. And that that's really what it is for me is it's a mindset that I think we as entrepreneurs need to adapt. Absolutely. And it's exactly like everything that you do is going to either show you what you want or what you don't want. And, and that's Mm -hmm. the failure in it. Like I, I really don't see anything as failure because you do something you're like, you know what, that's not how I really want to run my business. So we're not going to do that, but we wouldn't have known if we hadn't done it. And, and I think even on like the micro scale too, of just like, if, I mean, I don't use Etsy as much anymore, but before, like when they came out with a new feature, I was using it. Like I wasn't going to be in the chat rooms griping about how things have changed or like even, even in small scales, like, you know, the post office changed their forever stamp five cents. It's like, okay, but like it did, but So like, we have to move forward. Like, let's just figure out how to find profit in a different way to cover that. You know, it's like, I don't think it's helpful to fear those things. And you're totally right. It's like, it can be hugely beneficial, but I think just in general, just, I mean, I guess also being smart, like, you know, you can't try to be on top of every single platform and have a presence everywhere, like know your capacity. But if you see an opportunity that you're like, you know, I have the capacity to try this and I'm going to give it a go for sure, go for it. For sure, go for it. I think the other insight that you shared that is so critical is setting expectations of what you're going to learn in, whether it be a mastermind or a training or a mentor. Because I think, to your point, first of all, it starts with genuine curiosity. What's your own mindset? How are you on approaching it, right? If you're just hoping somebody else is going to do it for you. I mean, every successful training mentor coach that I've had it's, it's because they just direct you on, okay, these are the things you need to do. Right. But you got to go do it. Right. I mean, it's right. not, it's not, it's not handed to you for sure. But I think so often, you know, you talked about those that worked, those that didn't work. I think so often that's the challenge is people expect that it's going to be one and that's going to solve their problem. Right. And mm-hmm. a lot of times to your point, you, you find these ones that maybe you weren't sure about that end up being great. And then those that you thought were going to be great end up not being so great. I, I, I share like in, uh, in our insurance business, I have all these different kind of peer groups and mastermind groups that, that I'm a part of in it. And I learned a long time ago that not all of them are good, right? So you got to kind of hop in and, and hop out and understand which one's the right ones. But the ones that are good in my head, every time before I join one of those groups, like for, the, for that meeting, I have this voice in my head saying like, I don't need to do this. I'm too busy. I got these 17 other things. I'm not going to learn anything anyway. Just move on. And I just commit to that time. And invariably, every single time I learn something and I, and, right. and something that I can take action from. But I think a lot of times we just, we set such high expectations of what that thing is going to do for us. When in reality, it, if it, if it creates action and creates progress, more often than not, that's pretty much the goal. Definitely. And I think to your point earlier, going into those kind of spaces with a clarity of vision is helpful too, because otherwise it can be like shiny object syndrome where it's like, oh, they're doing that. I should do that. But like, is that actually what my business needs? Maybe not. So I've definitely Mm -hmm. experienced that where I've like, uh, particularly when I was doing coaching and stuff, I was like, oh, I need to have this kind of thing and this level and this, and then I'll have this product. And it's like, that doesn't make sense for what I was doing. So I think also going in with a clear vision, um, yeah, diving in with, without a clear vision and with thinking they're going to save you. I think that's the only way they won't be beneficial, but if you can get those two things like pretty clear, um, I, I don't think there's any risk, honestly, in investing in yourself through education. 
Jess, I've been following you for a while on, on social media, and I think one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why you've built such a great following and why people love you is because of the the vulnerability and the the the, the real authenticity that you provide online. Could you shed some light on on how you how you manage some of that, how you go about building your your brand and your personal brand online? For sure. Um I think my <laughs> I feel like kind of my like just core is like a sharer. <laughs> so sometimes I have to like worry about, you know, oversharing, which I don't think is is true. Like it's only happened a couple of times where I'm like, I don't know if that I was ready to share that yet. I think I'm I'm pretty much an open book all the time, but I like um <sighs> Brene Brown said, um, this is this is more like with the grief aspect than just marketing, but I'll get back to that. Brene Brown said something where she's like, it's good to share scars, not wounds. So I think some to before you get super vulnerable, make sure you're super clear on where you're at with it. Because if you share something really raw, the feedback that comes in can kind of shape your experience. And I don't think that that's very healthy. So um, I do, you know, I have a therapist, I have really close friends that like who all hear everything way before my audience ever would. Um, and I think that that's a really safe way to be vulnerable online. Um, but also I think that like people crave connection and they crave, mm -hmm. I think marketing in its best form is storytelling and that requires vulnerability and requires sharing. And, um, and I enjoy that. I feel like I also crave connection and I found that through the cancer community early on because like Tommy and I were 26 when he was diagnosed. He was 30 when I lost him. Um, I don't have any peers that have gone through that. And it took the internet. It took social media platforms. It took Instagram to find these people, find that common ground. And I think there's just so much benefit to sharing. There's so much benefit to being vulnerable. Like you can create these communities. You can find these people, find these connections. And every major connection I've made in my business has been through a point of vulnerability on one of our sides. And I think that, I don't know, I don't think that's coincidence. So um, yeah, I would just say, obviously share what you're comfortable with. Um, make sure that you know where your head's at and are sharing from a protected space. Um, and there's there's just a lot of benefit in this this generation, this time and space to being real. And I, and I like, I, that sounds so dumb to say, but there's just so much curated, so much not raw that I think people gravitate towards it. And I think that's, was really helpful during our cancer fight too, was seeing other people share what they were actually going through knowing you're not alone in something. And, um, and I really think like, no matter what your industry, you can find that sweet spot. Like you can find where is the human connection in this and, and that's, what's going to sell your product more so than perfectly curated feeds. 1000% agree with that. I was going to ask one last question about leadership mm -hmm. and how you approach it, but I'm, I'm wondering if a lot of the way you approach your brand and who you are, just your authenticity, if a lot of that bleeds into your leadership. So can you talk a little bit about your leadership style now that you have a team and you've built out your company a little bit more than you had five years ago? For sure. And I'm still in the new stages of that. So I have people helping me with um, processing orders. I have a bookkeeping team. I have like um, accountants like that. I'm at that level. Um, so I feel like I'm I'm really interested in their feedback too, because this is something that I've built 100% myself in kind of this echo chamber of like, this is how I think I should be running these things. And this was what feels good. But having that outside eye, particularly early on, I think having collaborative people early on is really helpful. So, um, you know, I tried doing things like virtual assistants of people like that were just helping with tasks and stuff. And, and for me, I know, I, I feel like that's really common that people are like pick tasks that you don't need to do and send them to someone. And, and of course that's really helpful. But for me right now, I think it's having people that can say like, I see why you set it up this way. I'm not sure it makes sense at this moment now that we've scaled and like, let's talk about that. And, um, so I'd say like my style is collaborative. I think it's, um, really honest too, with like where we're at, where we want to go. Um, I, yeah, I love hearing their feedback and their ideas. And, and I think 
yeah, I'm, I'm, ex- I'm still exploring that. And I'm, I'm reading a lot, like, even though I'm not, you know, a CEO of like, a, even even 20 people, like I'm reading books about how to do that in a good way, like how to have a clear company mission, like how to have great company uh, culture, you know, stuff like that. So I, I think it's just like this new season of learning for me. And it's something that I'm going to be analytical about as I'm going forward and like really taking the time to make sure that I'm moving in the direction I want. Um, so yeah, yeah, still, still new, but excited about what that's going to look like for sure. Cool. Well, Jess, on that note, we've got to wrap things up, but, uh, I just want to say thank you for a very unique, um, fresh perspective from, from our lens. We talk to a lot of business leaders and we really enjoy the different perspectives, but uh, just your true authenticity and you're willing to be open with us. Uh, great conversation. We'd love to have you back. But before we let you go, can you tell the audience a little bit more about what you have going on and where they can find you and some of your awesome cards? Absolutely. So you can find me at five dot post.com. That's all spelled out. I know it's confusing because the dot, um, but it's F I V E D O T P O S T.com. Um, I sell all of my cards there just direct to consumer, but you can also click on the retailer page and it'll show you every shop that might be near you. Like I said, we're in, um, over 250 shops nationwide and hopefully expanding soon to more, um, and yeah, if you're a retailer, you can shop on fair, uh, we're on fair wholesaling and that's the best place to find us about to be releasing the new holiday line over there, which is really exciting. And, um, yeah, lots of new stuff, three new product categories coming out in July. So follow over on five dot post on Instagram too. Uh, and that's where you'll see everything first. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks again. That was a great conversation. I can't wait to go back and listen. For all the listeners out there, thank you so much for your ears and your time today. We appreciate you. Until next time, peace. Thank you for being part of the Hustle Nation. If you're serious about raising the bar in your personal and professional life and willing to go all in on your success, head over to hustleleaders.com. Here you can get access to our Hustle Productivity ebook, attend our Hustle Masterclass, or challenge yourself to the 30 day Hustle Challenge. Pairing these tools and training with the Hustle Nation podcast will help you advance to a whole new level. Until next time, stay hungry and inspire those around you to hustle.